It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 303 of Science on Top. Today is Monday the 9th of July 2018. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Lucas Randall. Hey. And a linguist at the University of Western Australia and presenter on the weekly podcast and radio show Talk the Talk. Welcome back, Daniel Midgley. Hello. It's been a while, but uh, always great to have you back on the show. I always enjoy having a chat with y'all. Excellent. And a quick reminder to everyone, you can help us make the show by going to scienceontop.com slash donate to support us on Patreon. Every little bit helps. Choose whichever reward you want and how much you're prepared to uh, commit. And uh, we appreciate every little bit. And today we'll be talking to the animals. We'll be talking about a galaxy with almost no dark matter. And we'll talk about people pretending to be bots. But let's start off with talking animals. We've seen quite a lot of it over the last hundred or so years. Scientists trying to teach animals to communicate. Uh, we've had Alex the parrot. Uh, we've had a killer whale that seemed to mimic uh, English words. Not very well because it was talking through its blowhole and that's not a euphemism. Uh, but, but perhaps the most success we've had has been with teaching sign language to other primates like the chimpanzees Washo and Nim Chimsky. Great name. That's great name. And Coco the gorilla, who died in her sleep a few weeks ago. Now, before we get into the Coco's story, Daniel, we should probably clarify there's a big difference between communication and language, isn't there? That's right. I mean, all animals, all organisms can do what we might call communicating, uh, we can communicate too, not even using language. You know, like it's been said that uh, a haircut communicates things or a clothing communicates things. But this wouldn't necessarily be language in the way that linguists think of it. If, uh, if a linguist describes language, it would include stuff like using symbols to stand for other things. And one thing about human language is that the symbols that we use, like the sounds that we say or the words that we say, they can be broken down and then built up again into new sentences. Like if, you know, if I have a sentence like, I feel like a sandwich right now. And then you tell me that there's a new word. Uh, let's just make it up. Uh, gloob. And gloob is pancakes with Vegemite and uh, cheese sauce. On them. Good God. Okay. <laughs> what is this abomination? But I could then take that and say, I feel like a gloob right now. Right? And I can. You're crazy, man. <laughs> <laughs> Try and stop me. <laughs> but these are things that we can do in human languages and uh, in all human languages. And other animal communication systems can be very complex, but they don't seem to do those things precisely. But the question was could they? If we were able to get chimpanzees or apes or orangutans or whoever on the same page as us, would we be able to communicate with them? Would they be able to learn a human communication system? And you know, what would they say? They'd say, let me out. <laughs> so I don't want that gloob again. <laughs> no more gloob. No more gloob. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about Coco then. Um, she died at the age of 46 and, as I said, famous for sign language then. Uh, I think it was she was claimed that she could uh, use, I think it was, was it 2,000 uh, words from American Sign Language? It was claimed uh, that she understood and could use 1,000 okay. signs from American Sign Language and also 2,000 words of spoken English, that she could understand 2,000 spoken English words. Except you have to watch out because it was claimed as far as the signs go, they weren't actual ASL signs, they were modified signs. Okay. Modified because she doesn't have the same hands as us? I mean, I assume there's some modification required, or modified as in reinterpreted that Coco made this sign, therefore we're going to attribute this meaning to it. 
it meant that if you got Coco talking to an actual ASL speaker, the ASL signer wouldn't recognize the signs, but the people who work with Coco would understand the signs. They were sort of their own takeoffs on things, which is kind of convenient. Were they consistent? Apparently, although this is where things get a little tough because there is videotape of Coco doing stuff, but the the folks on the Coco project from the Gorilla Foundation uh, weren't good at releasing their data. Uh, yeah, that's probably, chestnut. That's a warning sign as well, isn't it? It's like Bazinski sort of scenario. Sorry, well, uh, yes, and it's kind of tricky because there have been projects where the the data was public and and released. I'm thinking of Washoe and Nimchimsky, and. Uh, there was a researcher who had worked on the Nimchimsky project called Herb Terrace, and he reviewed the the uh, NIM data and concluded that there was nothing languagey going on, that all of the signs were either recycled, just the sign, the, the human would ask a question or sign something, and then NIM would just sort of hand back one of the signs. And, and then, because we're human, we take that as an answer. We say, oh, I... I, I I asked a question. I got a response. Well, maybe, or mm. maybe it's just that you got back a sign that was recycled. Another thing that was claimed as far as NIM was, or th- this one's Washoe actually, who was a chimpanzee. It was claimed that Washoe could make new signs that when he was taken to a pond and saw a duck, he spontaneously created the sign water bird, which is pretty good. Ex- okay. Except that we don't know whether he was saying, "There's some water." There's, There's a bird. A bird. <laughs> right? yeah. we, we sort of we sort of anthropomorphize this, and we sort of fall into these these very human sort of mistakes. We impute intentionality. <laughs> when it rains, we think that the sky is raining at us, or when it thunders, we think that the gods are angry at us, or when we see a sign that looks non-random. We impute meaning because we live in a world of of languagey humans. I think it's also maybe a bit deeper than that as well when you're talking science. I think we often want to, uh, in a way, prove our uh, hypothesis kind of thing, which, even though scientists are supposed to be disproving hypotheses a lot. But we kind of want to get the results that we are expecting, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. And that's rampant in science. And that's really hard when it comes to humans who are caring for animals and who are invested in the animals and who want the animals to do well. Like I know that that the folks at the Gorilla Foundation were really big on um, preservation efforts Mm -hmm. for gorillas, you know, and that's that's worthwhile. Um, But how do you convince somebody that what they're doing isn't actually what they think is happening? I mean, nobody wants to think that what they've been doing is a waste of time. And so uh, it's very tempting to read things in. And uh, I think we'll see some examples of humans reading things in where maybe there wasn't anything. Well, actually, you did link us to a great uh, example of this almost, which was the transcript of a web chat done back in 1998 on this thing called AOL, which I believe was a service that just (laughs) sent out CDs to everybody. Um, (laughs) And and just reading some of the, quote, dialogue between Coco and uh, her handler Penny and the internet readers, I guess, is just extraordinary. And it it really doesn't do Coco any favours. we might want to actually reenact some of this, I think, because the audience deserves to know just how ridiculous some of this was, I think. L- Lucas, you can be Coco. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I, I have heard people say that this chat is not a good representation of Coco's abilities, but in the absence of primary data, this is a very nice, long, unedited stretch of the dynamic that was, that was going on at the time. Oh, so now I now apparently refer to myself as fine animal person gorilla in sign language. <laughs> now, um, so who, who am I? Okay, so let's start reading. So who am I? Am I going to be 
Penny or am I going to be Noel? I think you should be Penny. I will, I will represent the masses. Sounds great. Are we all ready? Ready. Okay. Um, Mini Kitty asks Coco, are you going to have a baby in the future? Okay. Is that for Coco? Coco, are you going to have a baby in the future? Coco, love, eat, sip. Me too. <laughs> the, the AOL person is incredibly credulous, I think. Um, what about a baby? You going to have baby? She's just thinking. Her hands are together. <laughs> I don't. I don't apparently say anything. So nothing. Unattention. You say you, unattention. <laughs> you have to give the unattention signal. Oh, is that is that actually a signal? I think it is. I think it means that Coco is not paying attention or she's offline. Like, don't bug me. <laughs> she's offline. <laughs> Talk to the hand, because Coco ain't listening. You know what it is? Her AOL just dropped out, and it's just on the modem. Current Sarna, that AOL. Okay, so Coco signs unattention, and then I say, oh, poor sweetheart. She said unattention. She covered her face with her hands, which means it's not happening, basically, or it hasn't happened yet. I don't see it. That's sad. It is responding to the question. In other words, she hasn't had one yet, and she doesn't see a future here. And then Penny goes on for quite a bit more. Yeah. That's amazing that she can get so much out of nothing. That's incredible. <laughs> mm, mm. Yeah, she goes on at length about how she can't have a baby because they need a sort of a family structure. They need more females and ratio of males to females and stuff. Mm. Holy crap. Can Penny read palms as well? <laughs> <laughs> now, you, now, now, we haven't seen all the data. I could be cherry picking. And, and by the way, if, if folks want to read this, they can read the whole thing. It's up online. It, this file used to be on the Gorilla Foundation website. It's been pulled down. I don't know why. The Gorilla's but, pulled it down. Does anyone, um, anyone knowing? It's the revolution. But um, <laughs> We'll have a link to it in the show notes. That's uh, great. Let's go on to number 40. Okay, we're going to keep on going. All right. Storm1004 asks, Dear Coco, I've watched you for years now. Oh, this is like so many emails I get. Um, <laughs> I've seen you grow up. <laughs> Dear Coco, I've watched you for years now. Your gentle spirit is inspiration for many. I'd like to know what you'd like for your birthday. What a sweet question. Okay. Your birthday's coming up, Coco. What do you want for your birthday? What do you want? Birthday. Food. Smokes. <laughs> smokes? Well, she sort of signed food and smokes. You have to understand... Smoke is also the sign for her kitten. Her kitten's name is Smokey. So she so, wants to eat a kitten? <laughs> so, that, so that one could have a double meaning. Yes, she does still have Smokey. She's looking out the window right now, so her back is to me. Right. So, yeah, I interpret that as Lucas did. She wants to eat her cat. Well, it's kind of odd because the, the question, what do you want, implies that you don't have something, but she does mm. have her kitten. So mm. that's interesting. Um, one more, just to get the idea. Let's go to 45. I think we've already got the idea, but okay. A basic earthy question for Coco from Earth to Kim. Coco, what is your favorite food, fruit, or vegetable? Okay, hey, we got a question for you, honey. What's your favorite food? The one you like to eat the very best. What's your favorite food? The one you like best. Okay, she's thinking. People have a lot of stereotypes. Sip. She likes drinks. What's your favorite drink? Do you have a favorite drink? Drink apple. That's pretty good, right? Okay, so so you ask, what's mm -hmm. your favorite drink? Drink apple. Good, yeah. right? Yeah. That's a hit. Yeah, okay. I can give you that. It could also be that she's just responding to part of the question, drink, and with an unrelated thing, apple. But yeah, okay, I can see how you can at least interpret that as direct communication. Remember all of a lot more responsible, responsive than a lot of teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> Remember also that sometimes there's a tendency for apes to hand back part mm. of the sign they just got. So, mm, mm -hmm. okay, let's keep going. Uh, I think we get the picture here. <laughs> this is oh, I, but I but I love this next example. Right. You can take it out if you want to, but this is so good. Okay, sick boy re asks Coco, have you taught other gorillas sign language on your own? That's a good question. Have you taught other gorillas to sign? Myself, lip. She taught herself. That's really true, too. That's very good. And I think what part of that answer might be is that she's taught us. In other words, myself, lip was her answer. And lip 
is her word for woman. So herself has taught lips, perhaps. So there are a couple of interpretations there. Okay, what? that is just, no, <laughs> apart from the fact that that's almost word salad, uh, it's, it's complete BS. I'm calling it, that's BS. <laughs> uh, and, and yet, if you say this, you are Chili, the elf who could not love. I mean, wow. <laughs> okay. You know what I mean? People have said I that mean, about it before, to be honest with you. <laughs> I'm very Wait, I mean, this, this is the this is the yeah. problem with being a skeptic, right? You're you're really mean yep. Yep. if you're a skeptic. Yep. And when Carl Co people's fun. Well, that's it, isn't it? And and the BBC and the ABC in Australia were full of things like Coco, the ape who mastered sign language. Coco, the ape who learned sign language. Well, there are a number of problems with this. Um, people kind of accept uncritically the idea that that Coco or other ape projects just sort of learned sign and, and they don't dig into it or they kind of just accept it. And well, that's a bit of a problem. But then if you come along and say, mm, this isn't really mastery on any level, I even, I even doubt that she was communicating. If anything, I think that she was doing complicated tricks for treats and uh, she had to do something to get food and treats from humans who had the key to the cupboard. And so you sort of do what you can until something good happens. This is pure operant conditioning. And if you think that this is some sort of message that the ape is giving you, then I think you're being very creative or very credulous. It, it does It does remind me a little bit of the clever Hans story, mm -hmm. you know, the, the horse that could tap out the, the uh, mathematical do answers. Maths. Do maths. Have you heard about that one? Yeah, it does. It reminds me of clever Hans as well. Um, Hans was very sensitive to just, and, and it wasn't fakery. Clever Hans wasn't faking. There had been other projects like Clever Hans before. You know, Fluffy the Wonder Dog, who could do calculus. You know, it's very simple to unmask this sort of thing. All you had to do was just take away the trainer who was passing the signals. Hans wasn't doing that. If I walked up to Hans, I would have gotten the same sort of thing. Hans would have been able to answer my questions. Because you say, Hans, what's three plus four? And then, and then you sort of wait, and maybe you give off a cue, like you know, you raise your eyebrows. That was Hans's cue to start stomping, stomp, 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 stomp. And then when he gets to seven, you kind of think to yourself, "Ooh, that was, that was the right answer. I wonder if he's going to stop." And as as you think that, you flare your nostrils, or you straighten up a little bit, or you you do something that tells Hans time to stop. And it's a very, very compelling illusion. Mm. It actually reminded me a lot of facilitated communication. I was which about is to say that. Yes. Yeah. Really sad story. Maybe you could say what you know about that one, because that's not one that I know as much about. It's a really disturbing pseudo, it's an alternative medicine almost kind of thing um, for people who have difficulty communicating. Mm, like locked in syndrome, for example. Yeah, exactly. A facilitated communicator is someone who can by helping them guide their hand to uh, letters or a communication device, help them uh, communicate what they're trying to say. And it would be, it's, it's almost a bit like water divining where your hand is uh, going to where you're unintentionally thinking about moving something. Whereas the, the, the patient might be trying to move their hand there and the facilitated communicator would help them get to certain letters and everything. And it's a real sham because all you have to do is take the show the uh, the patient a picture or something and get them to say what the picture is, but you don't show the communicator, and then it's it's gibberish. They have no way of actually communicating uh, effectively, and it's just led to some horrific uh, stories of sexual yeah. abuse and, yeah. uh, and just yeah, taking yeah. advantage stories of people. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, really disturbing stuff. But the, the people who are the facilitated communicator, the, the facilitators, hmm. they often think something like, well, of course, I know what they're saying because, you know, we formed, we formed a bond, we formed an emotional relationship, well, just like you would with, with uh, an ape or a, a, a chimp or a bonobo or something like that. And, and, and I want to just point out, I'm not necessarily saying that they are charlatans necessarily. A lot of them genuinely believe that they can help people and they're doing it out of the goodness of their heart. 
but there are many who are not so noble and who are taking advantage. Sorry, you were saying, Daniel. And I, I, well, let me just follow on from that. I don't think that anybody involved in the stuff we're talking about was consciously trying to fool anybody or put one over. I think that they... True believers. It, yes, yes. Uh, is the term pious frauds, although that's not even a term that I want to use either. It's just that you are the easiest person to fool. And when you're invested, that's what happens. Like, you know, with my, I have a little tiny daughter. She's a year and a half old. She's gorgeous. She says stuff. And it is really hard to think, no, she did, she did not say that. Like, for example, I said to her, you're a real sweetheart. Did you know that? And just by a pure fluke of the babble that she says, she said something that sounded like, I did. <laughs> but she's far too young, far too young to be doing that kind of a sentence with due support and everything. I'm sure that it was just babble that sounded like coincidentally like English. Dan, but if- she's a linguist's daughter. Of course, uh, she's ahead of the game when it comes to language. <laughs> do, do, do you think she might be a genius? Really? Kind of? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, I'll certainly. Go with that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Did she point at her lip? Because that meant lots of <laughs> Oh, dear. So, I mean, you want to be respectful of the people who are involved here. You, you, people have feelings about this. People are invested. The nicest way that I can say this is that I don't think there was any real science going on here. I find that, and this does not detract from Coco being a very inspirational individual to a lot of people. The idea that apes have the right to exist and that they have uh, complicated thoughts, this we can we can give them that without having to say, hey everybody, this is language and uh, it's totally sign because it's not. I guess uh, my next question is more about generally, what is it that we hope to gain from studying how animals communicate and teaching them language? Well, it was claimed famously by Noam Chomsky. That's the Nim Chimsky connection. Yes, I appreciate that. <laughs> I, never, I never get over that one. Um, I, that I have a problem with that because I am always trying to refer to Noam Chomsky and I call him Nim Chimsky all the time by accident. <laughs> <laughs> it's really awkward. <laughs> <laughs> well, he famously claimed that there was no way that uh, other animals besides humans would be doing language, that the language was uniquely human, that language was something qualitatively different from animal communication. It wasn't the case, according to Chomsky, that if animals just did what they were doing, but did it more, they would arrive at language. He he reckoned that it was something totally different. And so people got the idea, what would happen if we gave them a, a human upbringing, if we exposed them to language, would they be able to do it? And the answer has been, there have been signs. There, there have been isolated signs that they are able to use in order to get stuff. And that's pretty interesting. That's a pretty interesting result. With Coco gone, and there's only one other project that is uh, operating right now, and that's with uh, Sue Savage Rumbaugh and Kanzi and Pan Bonisha. There are a couple of bonobos. And I have to say that I have, a, I would say the same thing about that project, but I have a bit of respect for for that project, Sue Savage Rumbaugh has engaged with critics. She has written stuff for Skeptic Magazine. You can go and check that out. And has not distanced herself from the scientific community in quite the same way that maybe Patterson and folks at the Gorilla Foundation have done. That's That's just my observation. Because, I mean, I, I mentioned in the intro Alex the Parrot, which I think has had it was a, a really, really smart parrot uh, who died, I think, maybe 10 years ago now almost. Uh, and and that was a really smart bird that could actually communicate, I think. Would you, is that fair to say that it did have some semblance of language? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, a lot of things have a semblance of language <laughs> because of our human tendency to impute intentionality where there maybe isn't one. I did follow Alex the parrot for a while. And... There's somebody who claimed to be a worker 
with Alex the parrot. And I don't know if this is true, so treat this as anonymous hearsay. But the same kind of techniques that we saw with Coco were kind of operating with Alex as well, that um, he would say, want grape, and then he would throw the grape on the ground. And then the workers would say, oh, well, he's just messing with us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like say, like create an interpretation that saves the, saves the illusion. Um, I see the same things at work, the same psychological defense mechanisms at work with Alex as I see with Coco, honestly. Okay. Well, there you go. So, so Daniel, can I just ask, with regard to other animals, what about things such as uh, dolphins that appear to have different, well, from what I've read, some do dolphin pods or family groups of dolphins can have almost like dialects or their own sort of um, squeaks and whatever for for certain things they've got like warning ones i guess other other animals particularly birds have got warning sounds and stuff like that but they i've read about certain particularly when they're cooperating on a on a hunt that sort of thing when they're when they're corralling fish into a particular area and stuff like that they they use certain um sounds that are that are repeated and and seem to be used to, almost like a word so at what point does it become considered language rather than just you know, a vocalization that has meaning. What's the difference between that and a word? Hmm. There have been some really interesting projects with citations, with uh, with symbols. I'm going to be talking to Dr. Stephanie King of the University of Western Australia later on for an episode of Talk the Talk this year, where I'll, where I'll find out more about that. But yes, it does appear that there are some really interesting things going on with uh, with dolphins and whales and also apes. So let's talk about the good stuff. Here's the good stuff that we can learn from them. Number one, there does appear to be some way in which their calls are learned and uh, where they, they pass down their signals. So that's very cool because learned communication, that's something that we previously thought was something only humans do. So that's really cool that that, that happens there. Another thing uh, that I've read, though I haven't researched this too much, is that there are examples in the animal kingdom of syntax. Remember how I said that with human language, we break down our signal, we, we break down our symbols and we build them up again to make new stuff? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That appears to be happening as well. For example, zebra finches, if you play them a recording of, of, of their sounds in a certain order, then they go to a certain place to find food. But if you mix up the calls, then it doesn't make any sense to them and they don't they don't go there. So there does appear to be, I guess, something that we could start to call syntax just a little bit. Another thing that that apes do, uh, I'm trying to remember which kind of ape this is, and I'm kind of blanking. It's not orangutans. I think it's I think it's gibbons. Gibbons do this thing where they holler in a certain direction. And then anywhere from 12 to 18 hours later, they go in that direction. It's almost like they're going, I'm coming over there. And then <laughs> <laughs> they go over there. So what that shows is that there's planning, goal-directed behavior, and they're, they're telegraphing that goal-direction behavior through vocalization. That's really cool. Really, yeah. You'd really want to look hard, long and hard at them, though, and say, did they also, you know, just to make sure they didn't also happen to go i'm going over there in six other directions but because you didn't go they didn't go that way there was no sort of bias um so you didn't notice it you know that that uh mm -hmm. that, that confirmation bias of, of oh my god it nodded in that direction and then it went in that direction a mere three days later then obviously <laughs> that is that is true that is a good point and uh, again as always it's important to have very strict controls and no like Make sure you don't have these shifting frames of reference so that, you know, th this signal can mean nine other things or, oh, 11 other things if we need them to, right? Right, yeah. Mm. Including Great people. point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this was the other thing. For Coco, nipple was a sound alike Sorry. for people, apparently. Yeah, I know. Nipple and people. They sound the same. Wait, in Wait, spoken English, in right? Spoken English, yeah, right, um, yeah. <laughs> what, what? Sign language. Uh, but... But guys, she could understand 2,000 words of spoken English, right? So it just keeps growing. Uh, it's impossible to fail. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's move on now and uh, 
Lucas is a really cool story. I love this. An international team of astronomers using several observatories and the Hubble Space Telescope have for the first time found a galaxy that is missing most, if not all, of its dark matter. This is extraordinary. Lucas, I thought we knew dark matter exists because without it we couldn't have galaxies. They would spin apart and uh, not be clumped together. What the hell is happening here? Yeah, Sorry, the, so, the dummy linguist here is going to need some stuff explained. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's okay. Me too. Um, <laughs> so, so yes, this this galaxy, this uh, this is NCG ten fifty two dash DF two, as we uh, call it. I uh, it's, 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 yeah, it's very. Uh, that's the friendly name. Um, but this this particular galaxy is very strange because it's doesn't appear, and this is based on measurements of its uh, overall size, luminosity, distance from us, and they from that can start to extrapolate how much mass it has. It appears to have, well, basically it seems to be about 400 times less, seems to have 400 times less dark matter than it should have for a galaxy of its mass, or possibly even none at all. So it's larger than Milky Way in terms of area, but it's, it contains about 250 times fewer stars. So it has a classification of uh, what's known as an ultra diffuse galaxy because obviously it's the significantly less density of stars in it. Now that is something that you would expect to start seeing if it didn't have the combined effect of all that dark matter plus the the the, the light stuff, the actual you know the, the baryonic matter that holds a, a galaxy together because that's one of the things as, as Ed's in the introduction that we we know that there doesn't appear to be enough luminous stuff and dust and other things that we can actually see in galaxies to stop them from flying apart. That's one of the ways that we know there, there appears to be something else there that we can't directly see. And that's obviously part of the reason why it's called dark matter. But in this case, we've got a basically a, a very large diffuse, almost globular cluster, but it's quite large, that, a, that it is very, very, it's almost like it's, it's only just kind of hanging around itself you know what i mean like it's like uh really kind of over these other stars i'm gonna i'm just hanging around until something better comes along and but you know they're kind of getting it pretty far apart and as i said if you did if you suddenly took away the dark matter maybe that's that's the kind of thing you'd start to see is how how long would they stay gra gravitationally bound together so the thing is with this one we have no freaking idea like no <laughs> we don't have any explanation for this at this point in time it is it is contrary to everything else we've seen. So that's why this is interesting because we've gone, whoa, what the hell? I'll just read you a little bit of uh, a quote from Peter Van Dokken from Yale University. He says, I spent an hour just staring at this image. This thing is, is astonishing. A gigantic blob so sparse that you can see galaxies behind it. It's a virtually see-through galaxy. Um, and basically, his his dumbfoundness, if that's a word, was was uh, was all because it shouldn't exist. Something this big, uh, we expect. Part of the classification of the galaxies is is that there there's a, a lot of stars that are gravitationally bound together. They've got certain uh, characteristics about them, and and this being such a large object in terms of area, means it's not wouldn't be termed a globular cluster, for example. It wouldn't be called a satellite galaxy. It's it's a galaxy in its own right, but it's just way less dense and it doesn't, it's not acting the way that normal galaxies do. So yeah, it's not, I can't tell you much about it. We don't know. <laughs> we, we just don't know what the hell. So it's basically just a loose sporadic collection of stars, essentially over a large area of maybe it's a lot of stars, but 250 times less than the Milky Way. So not a particularly big number of stars. And it's just kind of hanging there not acting yeah, like you, a galaxy. Yeah. If you if you imagine, I mean, one we, we've seen some some indications of of other of uh, these were actually globular clusters. Uh, so a while ago we did a story about this, and I'm I'm stretching my mind to go back here, but we did do a story some time ago about a I think it was a pair of globular clusters whose dark matter appeared to be offset from where the globular clusters actually were. Does that ring any bells, Ed? It was Vaguely. like it's, it's almost as though the, the dark matter had been dragged out of them, or they'd moved away from the dark matter in some way or whatever. I can't quite remember what uh, what that related to, but I, I know there's there's a story that we've done about that in the past. But um, one of the um, proposed uh, explanations 
and bear in mind, this is this is incredibly early days, so we don't really know much yet. But uh, in this particular story, it says, did a cataclysmic event such as the birth of a multitude of massive stars sweep out all of the gas and dark matter? Did the growth of a nearby massive elliptical galaxy, NCG 1052, billions of years ago play a role in the dark matter deficiency? Could another galaxy effectively have stolen its dark matter is kind of what it's talking about there. Which is, which also would be really cool to think about. So, if we've we've seen in the past these galaxies or globular clusters where the dark matter doesn't appear to be where the galaxy actually is, it was kind of offset on the sky, almost as though we're measuring. We're, we can measure the the dark matter by the effects that it has on things around it, right? So, if you're looking in the the sky and you can see that there appears to be an attractor here. There's something that's, you know, that, that's impacting upon things that are around it. But the epicenter of that attractor is not where the luminous stuff is. And that's weird. So if that were the case, is it possible to pull dark matter or for the galaxy or the, the, the baryonic matter to be pulled away from the dark matter? We don't know because we still don't know what the freaking hell it is. So <laughs> it's, well, it's hard. We've also talked before about rogue stars, stars that are not part of any galaxy. Maybe they've been ejected from a galaxy or they never uh -huh. quite became yeah, part right. of another galaxy. Yep. So this it could also just be a big collection of rogue stars that have just sort of clumped together loosely. It doesn't vaguely. appear to be because it's, it's the, the, the issue relates to the overall area and mass of these objects, they they are gravitationally interacting, so they are of a unit that we can call a galaxy, right? Because they're they're together, they're just really diffuse, and they're very, you know, they're, they're not dense enough. And as a result, it appears that they they either don't have dark matter or they have very very little dark matter, and that's the problem. Because as far as we know right now, we our 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 uh, theories as to how galaxies form involve dark matter as being there. So they shouldn't actually form a group unless there's a dark matter there. And I'm not talking about little groups of stars that form in one planetary nebula, for example, one, one star forming region. Like if you think of like the, the Orion Nebula, for example, big star forming region, that's the pillars of creation, all those really cool uh, Hubble uh, images of that area of the sky. Um, you've got all the material that's there that's that's basically starting to coalesce and 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 uh, form stars and there's a there's a lot of really big stars there that are that are pretty young so you get these star forming regions these these stellar nurseries as they're often called that could still exist regardless of whether or not there's there's galaxy around it but for for these stars to be in this common area together they are gravitationally interacting so they are a galaxy but they're yeah. just a really weak one Feel free to say that this is just nuts, but it's nuts. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> uh, that's fine. I'll, I'll accept that. Oh no, you—you um, you, you mean what you were going to say? Sorry, go on. You can't say anything more nuts than what we're seeing, so that's cool. Is it possible that we might be wrong in some way about dark matter? It's, it's, it's highly almost probable. Certainly. Yeah. We, we don't. I mean, we, and and it's things like this that 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 give us information we need because thus far. What we know about dark matter is based on completely on observational evidence. We've, we we can't we can we can measure it insofar as its effect on other things, but that's the only marker it leaves. All of our observations of all other galaxies thus far, if you add up all of the stuff that we can see, based on what we understand physics and how it works, based on what we understand, those galaxies should should basically spin apart. Uh, they they should fly apart because the rotation rate is such that they there's not enough gravity of all of those stars put together to hold them together, which mm -hmm. is where dark matter comes in. It's not the only place that it comes in as well because there's other there's other interactions that are occurring that we can't explain based on the uh, on the luminous matter only. So so in answer to your question, it's it's for sure that we don't fully understand it because we know so very little about dark matter. It's just really cool to see. A galaxy that's not doing what what we think they're meant to do, and that that either means what we think is wrong, which is awesome, or it means that more likely we don't have the full picture about about the interactions and what the the life cycle of a galaxy could actually be. So and it's also both, awesome, which is also <laughs> awesome. And this is one of the things I love about astronomy so much because there's just so much we don't know, and and uh, it's just yeah, it's it's really cool to see things that you can't explain. Things get a bit boring if you can explain stuff all the time.
does this hint at the existence of something else besides dark matter? Some other Aliens. strange force. Um, it's not love, necessarily. Ed, love. Yeah, <laughs> not necessarily. It it could well be that. Um, do we re- it, it, we know it's a diffuse galaxy, right? So it's a, an ultra diffuse galaxy. So these stars are very very sparsely populated anyway. It could well be that they're actually in the process of spreading apart. Now, I'm, I'm wildly extrapolating from what I've read here, by the way, but they could well be starting to f- sort of fly apart. Maybe it's dark matter has been stolen. Maybe it's dark matter has been removed somehow, or we don't know. I mean, we don't really know what it is, so we can't tell you how it would come or go. But but maybe what we're seeing matches, to some extent, the, the logic, because if the dark matter weren't there, then we would expect it to be diffused, because it would actually be starting to fly apart. But if that if that can happen, how can that happen? I mean, <laughs> that's really weird. So yeah, we I can't wait to see more about this. It's definitely I'll be, I've I've set up my feeds to tell me when I, there's more stories about NCG 1052 DF2, or as we'll call it, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> What's the deal with Steve? You know, <laughs> it does look like a Steve. I agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> Same sort of nose. What? Uh, All right. Let's look at artificial intelligence now. And a recent Wall Street Journal report has revealed that a lot of the big tech companies that are using AI to make our lives easier, well, a lot of the time they're supplementing the AI or even substituting it with actual humans. So a lot of the intelligence that we see in our phones and smart devices could really just be humans being paid very little to do things that maybe computers aren't yet capable of. Is that right, Daniel? Yeah, let me just get the feeling around here. Uh, Do we get freaked out by AIs? No. Okay. I I don't. I I, I feel that I should. But (laughs) I I kind of, I've seen just in that, I mean, we're all similar sort of age, I assume. We're within sort of 10 years of each other, I imagine. But I, I just, I feel that in our lifetimes, we've seen pretty cool improvements in ai oh. and we and, and i interact uh, with ai every day often in terms of you know like google and and all that sort of stuff so that that's pretty normal for me and i'm seeing quite significant steps for that over the years i saw things like dictation services that you could you know text to speech sort of thing or, or sorry speech to text i should say so mm. it's been a gradual thing, but we're still nowhere near where we're going to be, according to the movies that I grew up with. <laughs> nowhere near. And we don't have rocket just, jetpacks either. Uh, I just want to say that automatic speech recognition has got, it just in the last five to ten years, super, super good. So much better than it ever used to be. I remember the early days when people were putting Dragon on their computers to do t- dictation. Yeah. You had yep. to train it laboriously. And mm-hmm. you, know, you, you just don't have to do that because there's just piles of data. We've also seen games like Jeopardy, the quiz show, yep. and Go. And Watson. And, uh, yeah. And, yeah, Watson and Jeopardy. And, of course, um, No Limit Poker. There have also been some inroads there, which is a super complicated game because you've got there's bluffing and there's limited information. And um, AIs are doing really well. There's also marking essays. Um, <laughs> <laughs> marking essays is a weird area. I, I really want this to take off because I really hate marking, but <laughs> sure. Yeah, no, I get it. So far it's been easy to game a system by just doing gibberish sentences with complicated structure, because that's really all it's looking for. <laughs> Basically it's just counting commas. If it's got a lot of commas, then it's probably a good essay. But now we are seeing that um, if you want us to do an AI startup, you basically just, um, pretend that you are doing AI, but you just hire a lot of humans and then wait for AI to catch up. That's what you do. <laughs> I love yeah. that. <laughs> uh, um, so a lot of this is uh, things like MTurk, which I think it was, is it I Amazon? I heard about this just the other day. Oh, sorry, you're not, talk- you're not talking about the Turk chess playing machine. No, uh, so that was no, the Mechanical I- Turk was yes. the original... Uh, chess machine that was supposed to be able to beat grandmasters and everything and it turned out there was actually someone hiding inside it who was moving uh (laughs) pieces But MTurk, I think, was started by Amazon. Uh, mm-hmm. That's right. It's, it's a it's crowdsourced labor. So you can get someone to click on your link uh, and you might pay them five cents to do that or whatever. And it's how a lot of people will 
get lots and lots of favorites or tweets uh retweeted things like that and and you know you used to have you know click here because i get one click for uh, every i get five cents every time i get a click or whatever so it was part of a money advertising scheme that people were doing and it's been used for a lot of research as well fill out this uh, survey you know cost the researchers 50 cents or whatever for every time they do a survey or something and uh, don't forget also that lots and lots of projects that do natural language processing, which is the language side of AI, they have used something called Wizard of Oz systems for a long time. Um, you get some people to take a test or to, to use some software. They think that they're interacting with the computer, but they're actually interacting with you. And the reason you do that is that in the early stages, when you want to see sort of how the data is going to shake down, you do a Wizard of Oz system just so that you can see what kind of things you're going to see when you do the real test. And there's nothing dishonest about this. It's a normal part of research, no imputation of anything shady going on. But now we're seeing Wizard of Oz systems being used in this context where people think that they're interacting with a finished AI system. And in many cases, they're just not. And that's a really scary thing. I mean, it talks about Expensify Smart Scan, which is part of the Expensify app where you can take a photo of your receipts and it will optical character recognition. It will use its AI to categorize things and to uh, sort it all out. But that's actually often using people on these crowdsourced uh, labor sites who are reading your receipts and reading where you were picked up from, where you were dropped off on Uber and things like that which is not something that I think people were aware was going to happen. Mm. And people are more comfortable giving their personal data to a algorithm than an actual human. This actually goes back quite a ways. I'm thinking of Spinvox back in 2009. This was a service that uh, let people convert their answering machine messages into texts. And it came out that humans were doing some of this. And uh, a company spokesman had to come out and say, well, no, the overwhelming majority of messages were automated and that um, there's disgruntled workers. See, our system is getting so good that we've been able to uh, fire a lot of people, but now they're mad. And so now they're spreading this rumor about Spinbox. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't even know if Spinbox is still around. I think it got bought up. But I don't know, but a lot of companies have started doing that. I mean, Google Voice famously was using people's voicemails to train its uh, computer learning and uh, voice recognition systems uh, based on that. So I don't know. I get the feeling that we're really tightening up about this. I mean, in many cases, like 10 years ago, five years ago, we were just happy to scroll to the bottom and click, I agree to whatever you want to do. Go ahead, use my data. But mm. since... Since Cambridge Analytica, mm. I think that maybe they've had to become, like S Silicon Valley folks, have had to become a little more circumspect. Or have they? Are we still just as lazy about security, do you think? Oh, you've just come up with a great idea for a product. We should have a, an AI that scans the terms and conditions of what you're about to sign for <laughs> and lets you know if there's anything that's a concern for privacy. That's a hey, great that's idea. pretty good. That's like mm. a subset of the summarization tab. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would pay for that. I would definitely pay for that. Can't be asked making it, but I'd pay for it. It would just raise a ton of red flags and annoy you. That's true. And then you'd 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 have options that you could selectively downgrade your concern level, and you'd get to a point that it actually doesn't do anything anymore at all. Like most people do with their antivirus thing, where it pops up all the time. Yeah. Like, this is a concern. Oh, fuck <laughs> off. This well, is that user fuck access off. control thing, where are you sure you want to do this? And you have to type your password for every site yeah. that you actually <laughs> approve <that> of. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what it is? It's that Mark Twain story about the house that had this amazing burglar alarm system, but it kept going off, so they would just turn that room off when the alarm went. <laughs> and pretty soon they turned all the room off and then they found that there was a huge gang of burglars that had taken up residence in the best protected house in town uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I don't really know where to go with this story from that apart from just it happens it's probably happening on a lot of sites that you don't think it's happening on and it's probably not good it, it's kind of deceptive and we just need to wait for AI to get better before hopefully it'll uh, this sort of thing will reduce. I don't know. Deception's always going to be part of business. 
I don't know if this reduces our concerns about AI or if it stokes our concerns about AI. I mean, sometimes people freak out over AI. Um, oh no, they're going to take over our brains and shove us into the matrix. But they wouldn't freak out over AIs if they knew how difficult it was to make it work <laughs> and how much data it takes to do it. And so humans are doing it, but then people freak out over that because, oh no, humans are reading my email, listening to my answering machine. So people just hey, kind of freak out over someone else wants to read my goddamn email so I don't have to, <laughs> I'll be thrilled. I'm happily handing that over to a person. Seriously. See, you're one of those. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. You should we can, care more. The, the more that we... The more that we can we can uh, get rid of just noise and things that aren't contributing to, yeah. to you know what we're meant to do, I'd just be thrilled. Just, like I've been putting off my expense reports for the last two weeks, and I'm going to get a fine now because of it. But um, I just hate them so much. I hate typing all that stuff. Hate it. Anyway, hate marking. Sorry. Get robo markers. Bring on the robo markers. Bring them on. Yeah. Because if you want to do your expense reports, it's mturk.com. Actually, I don't know what the address is, but <laughs> it probably is that. <laughs> What's funny you mentioned that. I'm looking at Expensify right now and going, seriously, can I just give it to someone else to type all it up? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, you can. Um, I think that this is an area to watch. And um, in a few weeks, I'm heading over to the ACL, the Association for computational linguistics annual meeting. And what I hope to do is I hope to drag some people into a room and talk to them about ethics in AI. What's the current view on what's okay to do and what's not? And just how much deception or how much um, human intervention is it okay to have and not tell anybody? And mm. what is it okay to do with our data? That's, uh, that's going to come up on an episode of Talk the Talk probably as soon as I can. Very cool. Sorry, what computational linguistics is that? Mm -hmm. Essentially, using AI to translate things and and read yeah, and interpret them. Yeah, it's getting computers to do language jobs. Okay. So that there's a lot of stuff that falls under computational linguistics. You know, summarizing like spam detection, you know, recognizing intention in text, which is my work. Mm -hmm. Lots of stuff like that. All right. Well, I think uh, unless there's anything else people want to talk about, we're probably done, are we? I think so. I think we're done. I think so. Sorry, Coco. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Coco. I'm oh, sad about Coco. I don't feel as bad anymore. I, <laughs> <laughs> oh. I read about Coco any... dying. It's like, oh, that's sad. I didn't know it, Coco it, was full of <laughs> Well, I'm still sad oh, that she's on, dead. No, no. <laughs> Coco led a good life. Didn't have to do anything. Just make some hand gestures and she got fed. She had a great life. <laughs> well, you know, the whole the whole work was difficult and, and plagued with, with lack of rigor, but at least Coco was with people who cared about her, and that's got to be worth something. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think yep. what, the, what this show is, is reminding me is it's making me ask, is anything anything? No, <laughs> nothing is. <laughs> galaxies <laughs> aren't <laughs> galaxies anymore. And apes aren't AI anything. isn't AI. It's not and, AI. And chimps can't do sign language. Uh, well, gorillas can't. Well, that gorilla couldn't. Is that the anyway. show title? Is anything, anything? <laughs> anything, anything? <laughs> Was nothing real? This is, we've suddenly, we're in very sci-fi uh, territory yeah. here. This is, uh, yeah. Uh, I think the answer is that most things aren't anything. Most things are not a thing. Most things are not things. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <sighs> Uh, as always, all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 303. Don't forget, you can always help us out by going to scienceontop.com slash donate and supporting us on Patreon. Or just spread the word. Tell your friends to listen to us. Go on mturk.com and tell people that they have to you know, sign up and download the podcast. Why not? That's what it's there for. Ed. Anyway, uh, Daniel Midgley, thank you so much for joining us today. Lots of fun. People should definitely listen to Talk the Talk because it's a really cool podcast for anyone interested in words and language and how we communicate. But is there anything else that you wanted to plug? Uh, if you want to find out everything that we're doing, you can go over to our website, talkthetalkpodcast.com or head over to patreon.com slash talkthetalk. And thank you as always, Lucas. Thanks, Mike. And a big thank you to everyone for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then.
Coco's bond with the animal psychologist lasted all of her 46 years and revealed more than intelligence. Tender friendships with kittens challenged notions of animal savagery, and one cat's death reportedly plunged her into depression until she met Robin Williams. Skeptics have suggested Coco was just imitating her trainer. Bad for your teeth. See? Teeth? Bad for your teeth, then Coco signs teeth. But the Gorilla Foundation said this about her legacy. Coco touched the lives of millions as an icon for interspecies communication and empathy.